Hello everybody, this is David. Welcome back to my channel. This is the next in our video series, The Christian Ethic in the 21st Century. And we've been looking at the uh, Christian ethic in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and we've been looking at what the Christian ethic is, and it's an ethic of love and concern. And uh, we want to, I want to go deeper uh, in this, this video. We saw at the end of the, uh, the last video that God wants nothing but our good, goodwill towards mankind. And God's benevolence is all around us uh, and uh, round about us in, in that he gives us sunlight and rain to all people, for example. So this is what Christian love is. It's an attitude to other people. It is the set of the will or how we regard or how we act or behave towards other people. It's the attitude of, of a good will to all men that cannot be altered. A desire for men's good that nothing can kill. So quite clearly, this is simply not a response of the heart. This is not an emotional reaction. This is an act of the will. In this, it is not simply our heart that goes out to others. It is our whole personality. And this is why it can be commanded and demanded of us. It would be impossible to demand that we love people in a sense of falling in love with them in a way that I fell in love with my wife, for example. It would be impossible to demand that we love our enemies as we love those that are dear to us, for example, our families. Um, we must never try to wish anything but good for others because it is possible to say to us, you must try to be like God, to be like Jesus. It's that idea of imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must try to look every man in the eyes with the eyes of God, with the eyes of goodwill. Now Martin Luther noticed one thing about the love of God. In the Heidelberg Disputation of 1518, he was talking about the love of God and this is what he said, and I quote, Sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are attractive. End of quote. Great quote, don't you think? So God does not love us because we are attractive and because we are lovable people. He loves us as we are. And by his love, he recreates us and remakes us. That's what being born again is all about. This is how we ought to love others. We do not love them because they are lovable. No one needs anyone to command him to love a winsome and attractive person. The whole point about Christian love is that it is an attitude of the mind and of the will and the whole personality which can make us love the unlovely, the unlovable, the unloving, even those who hate us and hate hurt us and injure us in a sense that do what they like, we will never have anything but goodwill to them and we will never see anything but their good. Mm. That's a very high ideal, don't you think? This is the concern of a Christian because this is the concern of God. It is not a spasmodic emotional thing. It is not something that is dependent on the attractiveness of the other person. No, it has learned to look on men as God looks on them with an eye which is not blind to their faults and their failings and their sins, but which forever and ever yearns to help and the worse the man is the greater the yearning to help now this just reminds me as the, uh, as the songwriter said let me look upon the crowd as my saviour did till my eyes with tears grow dim let me look on the crowd as my saviour did and learn to love them 
for the love of him. Hallelujah. Now there is a sense in which the man the in which the more a man hurts me, the more I must love him, because the more he needs my love. Now this is not quite the end of the matter. Luther again begins the section of what I've just read uh, with, uh, with this quote, and I quote, The love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. Very different. End of quote. Now this is to say that human love loves only that which is lovable. Divine love, or God's love, or Jesus' love, loves that which is unlovable. And by loving it, makes it lovable. The Christian love, then, is to be like God's love. And it has the attitude of unchanging goodwill. That's what our attitude should be as Christians. Unchanging goodwill towards other people. It does not simply accept the other person as he is, as if it did not matter if he always remained the same and never became otherwise. No, the Christian, like God, wishes to love them into loveliness, into goodness, into love in return. Now, it doesn't always work, it has to be said, but sometimes it can so blessedly happen that we can love a person out of bitterness and out of hatred and into love, by loving them with the love of God. To answer hatred with hatred and bitterness with bitterness can do nothing but beget hatred and bitterness. Now, there are times when we will fail. People won't always respond um, in, 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 to, to our, in the way that we're loving them. But the only way to make the unloving loving is by love. And that is what Christian concern is. That's what it means. But we can go one step further. And again, it's the new thing that Jesus brought. The Christian ethic is not only concern, it is universal concern. It's concern for all people. Um, I guess the greatest moral teacher the Greeks ever had was Plato. And you can only describe the ethic of Plato as an aristocratic ethic. He saw life as aimed at the production of the philosopher kings, who were, as it were, right at the top of the human pyramid, the top of the pile, as we might say today, the top of the tree, the top of the food chain, as we might say today. And the ordinary people existed only to make life possible for the magnificent few. Hmm. So Greek civilization was built on slavery, and a slave was a living tool. Now, it took the world about 1800 years to discover this part of the Christian ethic. As late as 1895, the Salvation Army started work in India and lived among the Indians. Now, an English official said to the Salvationists, I don't know how you can bear to live among these people. To us, they're cattle, just cattle. What a terrible thing to say about another person. Anyway, that was India. What about right here at home? Do you know that as late as 1865, in this country, only one man in 24 had the vote? Just at the turn of the 18th century into the 19th century, the word democrat, as in democracy, and giving each person the vote, was a bad word. We were ruled by, by the elites, the ruling class, the, the Whigs and the Pens, as, uh, as, as we say. Uh, interesting enough, it was even in the church this was. Um, Thomas Cope, the famous Methodist, who was second only to John Wesley, writes to Henry Dundas, and I, this is, I'm going to quote him now, it's a terrible thing for a man to say, but that was the time when a considerable number of Democrats had crept in among us to the number of about 5,000. I was the principal means of their being entirely excluded from our society. Oh dear. End of quote. Even Queen Victoria herself wrote that she could never, and I quote this, be the queen of a democratic monarchy. End of quote. 
So it took the world a very long time to see that the Christian ethic demands not only concern, but universal concern, concern for all people. Now, in contrast to what went before, there is still something else to say. The Christian ethic demands concern. It demands universal concern, as we've just said, but it also demands passionate concern. So we've already looked at Plato's ethic. The other great Greek philosopher was Aristotle. And Aristotle produced one of the most famous of all ethical theories, the theory of what's called the mean, what we now call the happy medium. He taught that virtue or doing good is always the mean or the balance between two extremes. On the one side, there is the extreme of excess and on the other side, there is the extreme of defect. And in between, there is the mean. So on the one side, then, for example, there could be cowardice. On the other side, there is recklessness. And in between, there is courage. On the one side, there is the miser. And on the other side, there is the spendthrift. And in between, we have the generous man. Now, when you have an ethic like this, the one thing you can never have is enthusiasm. You're always busy calculating between too much and too little, balancing and adjusting. It's an ethic of calculation. But the Christian ethic is the passionate ethic. It is not the ethic of a man who carefully calculates every risk. It is the ethic of the man who flings himself into life and whose sympathy with men is a passion. So we have to add still something else of, to the concern of the Christian ethic. The concern of the Christian ethic is total concern. As Paul, the Apostle Paul, this is, saw it, man is body, soul and spirit. The body is the flesh and blood part of man. The soul, the psyche, is not what we usually mean by soul. The soul is, as it were, the life, the animal life of a man. Everything that lives has a psyche. An animal has a psyche. Even a plant has a psyche. Psyche is the breath of physical life which all living things share. The spirit, which is the pneuma, is that which is unique to man. This is what man alone has. This is the part of man which is akin to God and to which God can speak. Now here again, Christianity brought something new into the world. The ancient world, by and large, despised and feared the body. It taught that all men's troubles and sins and sufferings came from the fact that he had a body. Plato said that the body is the prison house of the soul. Seneca spoke of the detestable habitation of the body. Epictetus said that he was a poor soul shackled to a corpse. The ancient world hated the body. Now it has to be said there is still a strain in Christianity which is ashamed of the body, a strain which is frightened of sex and of physical things and which thinks that all things like that are not quite polite and should not be spoken of. But the Christian ethic is quite sure of two things. It is quite sure that we can take our body and offer it as a sacrifice to God, as we read in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. And that, in fact, is exactly what we must do. To allow the body to become weak and ill and inefficient and fat and flabby is a sin. It's just as much a sin to let our body run to seed as it is to let your soul run to seed. Physical fitness is one of the duties laid on a Christian. Second, the Christian is concerned with men's bodies as he is with their souls. William Booth, again, we'll go back to him, could never forget the saying of Jesus before the feeding of the 5,000. You give them something to eat as we read in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 16. This is why he started his food for the million shops, 
and why he gave men and women free meals. This is why Bramwell Booth was in Covent Garden, Covent Garden Market with a barrow at three o'clock in the morning begging for rejected vegetables and bones to make soup. This is why Booth said, and I quote, ready for this? No one gets a blessing if they have cold feet and nobody ever gets saved if they have toothache, end of quote. Booth knew that men's bodies mattered. George Whitfield was with Booth here. When Whitfield went to America, he, he took 150 common prayer books and a lot of books of sermons, yes, as he should, but he also took enough material things to fill two pages of print at Rand. For example, 24 striped flannel waistcoats, 12 dozen shirt buttons, rhubarb, senna, saffron, uh, gentian root, not sure what that is to be honest, a Cheshire cheese, three barrels of raisins, pepper, oatmeal, onions, sage, and two hog heads of fine white wine. When he got on board ship, he writes in his diary, and this is, this is what he wrote. The sick increased upon my hands, but were very thankful for my furnishing them with sage tea, sugar, broth, etc. Um, end of quote. So he reached America and we find him supplying a family with eight sows and a pig. We find him giving a cow and a calf to a poor woman and barrels of flour to a poor baker. There are times when sermons and prayers and Bible readings are very poor substitutes for a good meal. Yes. So we will not forget that the Christian ethic ought never to forget that men have bodies and these bodies are the property of God and that they matter to God. I'm going to leave the video here and we'll come back in the next video to see how the Christian ethic looks beyond this life. So I want to thank you for joining me in this video. See you on the next one. Bye bye.